Hello, everybody. My name is Chris Katchigan. I am the Senior Director for Federal Engineering over at CrowdStrike. Uh, today, I'm going to be covering uh, innovating for the future of cybersecurity in, this, in the public sector space. So just a little bit about myself real quick. Uh, I have about 17, 18 years of total industry experience, uh, ranging from uh, working for in the defense industrial base for about uh, 11, 12 years of that particular point in time. Um, after spending about that, uh, that time with Lockheed Martin, I shifted over to Intel Corporation, uh, where I was a senior principal engineer working for uh, security innovation for what we can do in hardware uh, products, hardware technologies to create new differentiating capabilities uh, within the platforms. Uh, after that, I spent a little bit of time at Tanium, and uh, now I'm over here at, uh, at CrowdStrike, uh, helping to get the U.S. federal market and public sector ramped up for this particular space. All right, so what do we do? CrowdStrike as a company, we stop breaches. Plain and simple, that's the mission statement. Uh, that's what we focus on. And in this uh, particular presentation, you're gonna see that over the past six years or so of what we've done in the commercial space on how we're going to apply this now to public sector and then you will uh, reap the benefits. All right, so from an agenda perspective, we're gonna cover a couple uh, topics here. Specifically, I'm gonna start with the lessons learned from uh, the Cyber Symposium CISO Academy that was held yesterday because this is some of your industry peers uh, within your public sector space and the concerns they shared. And um, I think most of you uh, will probably have similar concerns, uh, at least considering the bulk of them were all shared uh, from your, again, your CISO counterparts yesterday. Uh, we're gonna look at the trends. So we just released our 2018 uh, threat report and this covers uh, obviously the, the 2017 fiscal year and uh, some of the things we're seeing and again, how those things happen in the commercial space and we believe how they're gonna impact public sector. Uh, next, we're going to go into innovating uh, cybersecurity for the public sector and what you all can do to better bolster your defenses and effectiveness uh, long term. And then lastly, we're going to handle any questions and answers you all may have. And uh, I, I understand that obviously some of these questions are sensitive topics. So if anyone has anything that they don't feel like bringing up in public, uh, grab me. I'm around all day. I don't fly out till tomorrow morning. And uh, we can just have a sidebar conversation. All right, so yesterday's CISO Academy was absolutely awesome. Uh, there was 30 plus members of uh, various um, state of California, uh, counties, cities, agencies, uh, cooperatives, et cetera, that were all here. And some, these were some of the major issues that uh, were boiled up uh, amongst the group. First and form foremost was cloud. Um, just about every single person voiced some concerns about cloud. Sometimes initiatives are being cloud first, sometimes around being forced to the cloud and how they deal uh, with this in this ever-changing environment. Um, the next uh, real big topic was cybersecurity investment versus value received. So for example, if your board is saying, you know, uh, Chris, we're gonna give you $10 million of cybersecurity uh, budget, can you protect us effectively for that 10, uh, for that $10 million? Well, it's possible, um, but again, it all depends on where it's spent and how it's being utilized. Uh, people are the weakest link. I think this has been a recurring trend for the past, I don't know, 17, 18 years that I've been in, in industry. Um, the weakest link in the armor uh, is generally speaking the people. Um, and how do we work around that? Uh, emerging technologies. This obviously has a direct tie back to cloud, but not just cloud. Also uh, IoT and other uh, emerging, oh, we'll call it fully integrated capabilities that all have always on connectivity. Um, Artificial intelligence, machine learning, and neural networks. Uh, one of the, 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 uh, the presentations we spoke about yesterday um, was the concern for this impact, not just on the cybersecurity side of the house, but what if this capability is actually weaponized and turned against you, and how do you defend against this stuff? Again, threats of the future, but the, everyone's beginning to think about it now for how and what we can do in this particular space. Um, data overload was a massive concern. Um, some of these new tooling and capabilities are creating just massive, massive amounts of data, but how do we best adopt uh, big data technologies to better sort through and give us actionable uh, data sets or, or intelligence based on uh, what it's receiving? Um, evolving threats. So we're now beginning to see that certain things like you know, script kitties and hacktivists, et cetera, are starting to take on advanced persistent threat style and nation state style uh, tactics and, and capabilities. Um, so how do we you know, counter this, for, again, from a defensive posture to make it as effective as possible? Um, 
visibility. This, this kind of is actually similarly related to, uh, you know, concerns I've seen for the past 17, 18 years uh, the, uh, with, with people being the weakest link. Well, visibility is the, the, one of the biggest concerns people have. If you don't know what's on your network, whether it's hardware, software, versions, et cetera, what's running, uh, you can't properly defend the infrastructure. Um, and again, a massive challenge that will hopefully get this addressed for you all. And, and lastly, um, effective use of threat intelligence. And everyone voiced this opinion, and it's, it's not just the quality of the threat intelligence, but how do you actually best take the threat intel, uh, make sure it's properly curated, managed, et cetera, and use it within the infrastructure that you have. Um, this all ties back to the, the visibility and other technologies that get deployed. Um, but again, this, this is some of the massive concerns that they brought up. All right. So we're going to go through the observed uh, trends from 2017. Uh, some of this data you will see uh, from our just recently released 2018 threat report. Uh, so if you want to go through a fantastic roughly 50 page paper explaining everything from every single particular uh, sector, um, it, it's actually a phenomenal report. Now something that we did notice and is published within that report was there the two top sectors uh, specifically uh, that we saw uh, data breaches, um, uh, data exfiltration, and activity in was specifically uh, healthcare and government. Seeing how this is a public sector based uh, group that's gathered in front of us, um, generally speaking, government and healthcare falls in the public sector space. So again, you are the top targeted uh, sectors and for just malware, uh, data exfiltration, and just overall a nefarious intent. All right. So with some of the technology we get, um, we, you know, we, we protect, uh, let's see, more roughly 6 million endpoints, 176 countries over you know, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Um, on average, uh, our uh, technology receives uh, 90 billion events per day. Let me just say that one more time, 90 billion events per day. If you were feeding all that data into legacy SIM technologies or with various alerts and escalation processes and workflows, how would you manage that? Uh, I know organizations that struggle with the hundreds of thousands of events or billions of events per day, let alone billions, right? Um, when it's really, really busy and you know, adversarial activity or just a lot of work on the endpoints, we see anywhere from 1.4 million events per second with an average of about a million. Um, now, we'll touch upon this on the innovation side of the house, but we'll actually show you how our big data solutions and, and, cloud, uh, and cloud delivered security helps you adapt uh, to these new threats, again, with this massive data overload. overload. And again, we'll, we'll show you how to help you know, future-proof and innovate for the future. One of the other interesting trends we've had is actually breakout, or you know, again, also termed as lateral movement. On average, uh, we see that it takes no more, just under two hours, right? On average, one hour and 58 minutes for an adversary to uh, establish a beachhead in the environment and begin to break out, move laterally, and start performing their actions on objectives, All right? Um, now, this is obviously a statistical data based on what we see in the, in the commercial cloud, uh, but obviously we do expect this to hold very near true over on the public sector side of the house. And again, just from a trending perspective, just think about that. You see various reports for anywhere from 50, 60, 70, 80 days from initial uh, breach with legacy tool sets to detection, and the organizations know what's happening. Oftentimes, DHS, FBI, others are knocking on your door to say, hey, your infrastructure is attacking others. Again, uh, you know, just under two hours before initial breach to starting lateral movement. Now, um, last year, we saw some pieces around, uh, we'll call it malware versus malware free attacks, where it was, was roughly 50 50 um, split. Whereas, uh, you know, just traditional viruses, et cetera, on, on the malware side of the house, and the other pieces where it's, um, you know, PowerShell based or other things from a, from a malware free perspective. As we are bringing on more customers uh, within our, our segment, again, I think we're, we're just uh, north of uh, 6 million endpoints, approaching 7 million endpoints we've got protected. Um, we're finding, uh, we, we saw a shift back to a little bit more malware based, roughly 61% now. Again, this is just a statistical data compiled across the entire commercial cloud. But what, the reason for this is that we have found that there is so much malware still living in environments with legacy antivirus tools that it's caused the shift. Now, as we're cleaning up this infrastructure, we do fully expect to start seeing a shift back towards that 50-50 split. Uh, but this is just the trend that we've noticed as we're onboarding more and more customer sets. All right, and just from an overall AV effectiveness perspective, um, we've noticed that generally speaking, CrowdStrike catches uh, threats and, and malware seven days before additional uh, 
you know, uh, legacy antivirus tooling. So again, just why this is one of the again a reason why innovation is required, why we need to go to the next level in the public sector space. All right. So one of the great parts about CrowdStrike is we have phenomenal people, uh, technology, and intelligence. Uh, in fact, we actually started out as uh, intelligence and, and services that eventually uh, shifted our way into the endpoint uh, EDR, the endpoint detection and response space, and then into the prevention side of the house. Uh, because our, pro our, our everything we do is incorporating the people, the intelligence, and the technology, we are uniquely positioned to create actionable um, alerts to end users uh, for, again, this mitigation discovery exercises. So in a 24-hour period of time, we had roughly just north of 11 million hunting leads that came in. Uh, over 400,000 of them ended up being benign just based on just various uh, software indicators and other components. Uh, with that said, we ended up finding that, uh, in, again, in a 24-hour period of time, it, um, the, that 11 million um, hunting leads boiled down to 7,000 uh, 7, that were malicious or malicious intent, with two alerts having to come out for adversarial activity. So if you think about, again, the problem that was brought up earlier in the CISO Academy of how do you deal with massive data, how do you create actionable alerts and actionable intelligence, this is one of those ways by using innovative uh, next generation technologies like ours uh, that can help you uh, distill down the data sets into something that's more usable, more actionable. All right. So we're going to go hop in uh, to our uh, threat intelligence and some of the things we've seen within uh, 2017. Now, before we, we hop over into that, I just want to just paint the picture. Um, we do some pretty cool things with regard to tracking adversaries. Um, we track over 100 at this particular point in time, and we give them interesting names, again, for ease of tracking, and we also give them kind of cool logos, as you can see here up on the screen. Um, we, have, we track roughly two different sets, uh, nation-state sponsored and then um, non-nation-state uh, adversaries. And just some of the big hitters uh, on the nation state side of the house, you'll see anything that's referred to as, with the regard to being linked to China uh, is Panda, a bear are the Russians, uh, Kitten is Iran, uh, India is the tiger, and then North Korea is the Kalima, uh, which I think is a mythical uh, winged dragon, if uh, memory serves me correctly. Um, and over on the non-nation state adversaries, anything with a jackal in its name, think of it as activist groups, uh, activists, et cetera. And then spiders, generally speaking, uh, criminal groups. So think e-crime, et cetera. Okay, so some of the, the, uh, the components, let's just jump on in here. The, the rise of state-sponsored uh, ransomware. And, and I bring this up because of the, again, in public sector, the, the use of what we'll call it government and, um, and healthcare specifically. So in, in 2017, we saw multiple nation state act, uh, actors ad adopting ransomware and ransomware style attacks, um, specifically the, the Russians and North Koreans. And we think we have some tie back to the Iranians uh, that have used uh, ransomware. And again, for, for more detail on this, we can uh, go back to the 2018 threat report. Um, but what's interesting here is that it's, it's the threat and the risk of, of destruction. Um, so in the past, generally speaking, e-crime, would, they would exfiltrate data and just try and sell it on, on the black market. Um, now, the, the reason uh, that we're bringing this up here is because, as we called out earlier, uh, healthcare is one of the largest um, sectors that have been attacked that we've noticed from the 2018 threat brief. Now, let's just say, hypothetically speaking, you have your county healthcare uh, groups, your hospitals. Uh, and what would happen if ransomware got into those infrastructures, right? Um, I know friends that are nurses and doctors, and they tell me point blank that if their computer systems ever went down, it would impact patient care specifically. You know, life-threatening. Think about that for a second. People could die, right? Just let that sit in. Um, so if, the, you know, if your hospital systems get compromised, you could potentially lose uh, patient records. You could lose the ability to distribute uh, uh, controlled uh, substances for, uh, for medicine, et cetera. Again, all things that this is why um, you should care. And again, this could have a massive impact in, in the healthcare arena as nation states, again, shift over into this particular area. Uh, supply chain attacks. You know, typically in, in past supply chain, if you look at stuff that's happened over the past 10, 12, 20 years, um, oftentimes it's been like hardware level implants. So if you manufacture a bunch of stuff overseas, you put it in some boxes, you put it on a ship, and then you know, traditionally you'd have people that would go in and say modify the hardware as it's en route or add extra silicon at the factory to do extra things. Well, what we're seeing now is that the software supply chain is now being disrupted in a similar way. 
Um, every single organization here uh, relies on third-party software to do their, their job. It's just, it's, it's that simple. That's the way the world works today. Um, and if you have trusted software that is uh, properly signed coming from legitimate sources that has already been uh, breached at the source, right, this lends itself to significant challenges, right? A legitimate software is being installed and delivered and causes a, a massive problem with the infrastructure. And three examples of the uh, of software-based supply chain uh, attacks here. Again, uh, this has happened a lot of it, a little bit overseas in different areas, but this is something that could very, very easily happen uh, within healthcare, uh, government, and the rest of all overall public sector. Um, legitimate software sets uh, being used to deliver malware payloads to take over um, infrastructure. So I'll use the the, um, the ME doc, right? This was a, a tax accounting software mainly used in the Ukraine. Um, they breached uh, the software set. They, they embedded some malware within the, um, the infrastructure. And again, as people were pulling down software updates, software installations, basically the legitimate software came in weaponized, right? They had basically a free, uh, freestanding backdoor within the infrastructure to come in and do whatever they wanted. You know, uh, PyPy, another phenomenal example, right? So this is the, the Python, uh, the package manager, effectively. So effectively, you go in, you download, ver install various uh, uh, Python packages. Some of it came down weaponized with malware. And just think the prevalence of, of Python all over the world. Everyone uses it. I'm sorry, most people use it, I should say, in some various form or another. All right. So the 2018 outlook. Um, again, some of this data set is going to be sourced from our uh, 2018 a uh, report that we just republished about uh, about two or three weeks ago. Uh, and again, some phenomenal details if you want to see everything. But again, we'll just we'll cover the pieces that are targeted for public sector. Um, from a targeted intrusion perspective, um, we see an, an uptick of of cadence with regard to China. Um, specifically, there, we know their military is going under a reorganization, and therefore some of the adversarial groups in the state-sponsored activity that they have there is going through reorg as well. Um, as the reorganization begins to settle out, we do expect an, an uptick in act activity. Um, and again, because we tie back to that, we saw an uptick of ransomware pieces. Again, just wanted to let you all know that again, this is some of those things where it could begin uh, shifting. Um, China and its, I'm sorry, Russia and its dif uh, disinformation or misinformation campaigns are, are still part of their, their playbook. Um, you know, they, they're all, they're, the, the Russians are also very good at collaboration between their military and their e-crime uh, APT groups, and they, they do collaborate quite well. So, um, you know, as we've seen within, uh, we'll call it various events, you know, our, even our own country's president going on Twitter, Twitter wars, uh, you know, making people very, very unhappy. Um, this is just one of those things where just, it's just to be aware of. And then the, uh, the North Koreans, and uh, specifically, um, you know, heightened level of espionage. Generally speaking, most things they do are, are financially motivated in some way. Uh, sanctions are taking a massive toll. And a lot of the stuff that they do from just a malware perspective, again, uh, look at the nation state tie back to ransomware. They're doing everything they can to bring in additional uh, value add funding, et cetera. And especially with some of their um, the ransomware pieces just targeting, pulling in all sorts of Bitcoin. All right, and over onto the hacktivism side of the house. Uh, we do know full well that uh, public leaders, especially here in the US, whether it's the president, governors, other state representatives, when they you know, go crazy on Twitter every once in a while, uh, they tend to upset people every once in a while. You know? um, no one's gonna have the, the same opinions, but uh, the thing here is that act hacktivist groups are actually beginning to start look more and more like APT. Um, you kind of see it as, as an evolution, whereas the script kiddies start out just doing just very basic things that are very easy to detect. Um, over time, as they learn, as they get better, right, they start act, uh, looking like real a APT. So um, whether it's uh, politically motivated or just diplomatic issues, again, um, their, 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 their tactics are beginning to be more advanced. And uh, again, as we see more and more, um, we'll call it interaction with, generally speaking, with uh, public figures, especially considering in the public sector, uh, this is just a, a growing concern. All right, so as promised by uh, the, the name of, of the session, uh, let's, how do we innovate for public sector? Um, you know, first and foremost, we need to go beyond basic defenses. We need to go beyond basic now. We need to be able to do more, right? As, as we showed earlier in the slide, 61% of, uh, for 17 as we onboard more, more customers, 61% of those attacks and stuff we found was malware based. 39% wasn't. So think about that. Your legacy tools were only correct up to 61% of the time. Uh, we need to do something better, more innovative uh, to, again, make your security more effective within the industries itself. Um, we need to do continual risk assessment and, and establish real-time visibility. 
So the real-time visibility goes back to that challenge we discussed within the CISO Academy, right? Um, it's how do we get the visibility of faster understandments on the network. And, and that comes in with a couple different ways. Uh, use, you know, talking about uh, CrowdStrike's platform specifically, you know, uh, by having Falcon Host deployed, you know, we, we, we absorb in uh, what we talk about number in the first bullet here, go beyond traditional uh, just antivirus and malware-based defenses, right? So first and foremost, establish the visibility to so know everything that's happening on the endpoint. You know, kernel lo modules loaded, files open, files written to. Again, these are all just pieces of data we need from a real-time visibility perspective to understand what's happening in the, in, in the infrastructure. And we have good threat intelligence. We can actually tie back to motivations and other pieces to see what's happening within the infrastructure. All right, add threat hunting to your security portfolio. Um, somehow, some way, this has to start being a bit more proactive and doing additional things. Um, with the innovative technologies that we have that I'll talk about in the next slide, we can, uh, we can help uh, get some of those, the, the blocking and tackling done once we're deployed, right? And then once we have, have the threat hunting you, and you actually get good threat intelligence, you can begin looking for uh, various uh, things within infrastructure, again, People are um, becoming more and more targeted, especially on, on the healthcare and, and the government side of the house. So understanding what's happening within your infrastructure, getting the proper intelligence, getting the proper IOCs, again, you can begin hunting within the infrastructure looking for badness, right? Again, take it beyond just traditional malware-based defenses, that set it and forget it mentality that a lot of people have had in the past. All right, uh, integrate uh, threat intelligence into your endpoint security strategy. Um, this is absolutely key to what is necessary for the future. Um, good threat intelligence that's properly curated, that's properly managed, properly timed out when it's no longer valid um, is absolutely key and especially ties back to number three on, on the threat hunting side of the house. Um, there's a lot of unknown threats that are out there, right? Uh, they're with move beyond signatures. They're, uh, you know, you're looking at more attribute based, behavioral based and intent based looking at, at your industry again. Um, this, this will absolutely be key when time to get it, considering that there is a shortage of skilled hunters within the infrastructure, uh, so within most organizations. Um, you know, and generally speaking, I've found that within my experience with public sector, there are already, you, are, you are already underfunded, you are already understaffed, and something like good threat intelligence will help you find that needle in the haystack a lot faster. Um, lastly, you know, we'll call, look at this as the more the proactive exercises, right? How do you assess the readiness against your sophisticated attacks? There's two ways to do this. You know, uh, we can come in, for example, and do proactive services. So think, sit down with your leadership, review your policies, do tabletop exercises, the what-if scenarios, right? How would you, what would you do in the event of a breach? But then there's the other aspect of it as well. So what happens if an adversary actually comes at you in a particular way? You know, have organizations like ourselves come in and attack you the exact same way the adversaries within your sector attack you. Use their TTPs, use their malware, use the exact same way they move lateral with the infrastructure. Test it, make sure that you can, you can find them, and then actually modify your, your defenses based on the, the inputs and outputs of that. All right, so what does innovation look like? So being uh, at CrowdStrike, and as I mentioned before, um, we have, what we think is a phenomenal formula. We've got the proper people with the intel and the technology. And what I'm showing here up on the screen is our Falcon platform. And this is what we believe is part of the innovation for the future. So first, let's talk about the power of one, right? We have a single lightweight agent, 25 meg in size, that does everything we do, right? Um, and because of this single agent and it's extremely lightweight, we average over a 24 hour scale, uh, period of time, 1% CPU utilization. Think about that. Some of the legacy tools that have three, four, five, six, seven, eight agents use anywhere from 25 to 40 percent of your of your of your system resources. We use on average one, um, and with the, that single agent, again, it's it's minimal load, and we have proper visibility into both user space and kernel space. So we have again complete endpoint visibility and, and understand the context of everything that's happening. Um, but what drives it all is our Falcon platform, and I'll, I'll go into some of the stuff on the big data on the next slide. But we deliver a couple pieces on top of that, that single uh, Falcon platform and our threat graph technology, uh, specifically on the endpoint security side of the house. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we started out in the EDR space, right? How we, so we, maintain, we established proper visibility into the endpoints first so that we can see everything that's happening, right? Give you visibility, give you context when we have our, our threat intelligence plugged in. Um, since once we've mastered the, the EDR side of the house on the visibility side, Right? And we said, okay, we, we know the bad stuff that's happening, we know how the adversaries work, and we know what they're doing. So now we added in what we call our, our next generation antivirus technology. Right? So completely signatureless, 
Um, in fact, we have a machine learning model that's on sensor that's looking at all the stuff that's happening on the endpoint. Right? There's only a certain number of ways to you know, pop a system, right? to establish a foothold, you know, say dump password credentials, et cetera, from memory. Uh, we know how all the stuff operates and our machine learning model constantly is, is looking and on, locally in the endpoint. If we see something bad, we just step in and we prevent it. It's that simple. Again, all signatureless. You know, uh, I don't know about you all, but I remember when I was actually maintaining some legacy tools in the past, I mean, pushing out DAT files was such a pain, right? I hated having to do it every 24 hour period of time, but then when you had supplemental DAT files and I had three, four, 500,000 endpoints that I had to get this stuff out to, right? Um, just the, the lack of, of DAT push out speed created this massive, um, we'll call coverage problems. And we don't have to deal with that anymore, which is, which is great. Um, and then using the same single uh, universal agent, we've already got the visibility and the next gen AV prevention, but let's say uh, there, there's a new challenge with some of our customers brought up. And I'll use the, the example of, um, of USB devices running rapid, right? So we got a phone call from some of our customers that said, hey, it'd be great if you guys could, could give us uh, visibility into devices. So we said, great. So we added a little bit more modifications to our agent. We added the ability to do uh, device control, first off visibility, and then soon to be prevention policies based on devices, right? So. Um, you know, something plug in, look like storage, but maybe it starts doing a lot of power draw and, and acting uh, like a non-storage device. You know, typical rubber ducky style attacks. Again, that same single agent allows us to step in and do all those different preventions. Um, over on the security operations side of the house, now this is more of our, where our people come in um, and our, some of our other services components, um, we have something called Overwatch, right? Again, uh, we'll think of it as proactive threat hunting for your organization. You know, it's not that you're buying services, you actually buy a single SKU to do this. And it's all built and run on top of the exact same Falcon platform that you already have deployed once it's out there. Again, if you want, so if you need a supplemental help, you're already understaffed. If, if you're under budget, I'm sorry, if you're uh, not gonna have funding, this could be a very easy way to close a, a coverage and, and capabilities and a shortage of, of available staff to do some things for you. Um, also, uh, within the, the same platform, we've got the ability to do, again, uh, IT hygiene. Right? So this, this ties back to uh, EDR and visibility, but be able to tell you, hey, what is everything that's, that's running on your network? All the hardware and, and plugged in network devices that we found. Discover all the IoT, uh, all the IoT devices. Right? Understand what's running with regard to software versions, uh, their specific patch levels, et cetera, based on, uh, on, on CVEs, et cetera. We give you that full visibility. And then use the, the exact same lightweight agent, we do scanless uh, vulnerability management as well too because we, again, we see the processes that are executed. We, we know where their hashes are. It's very easy to tie back to say, hey, this particular piece of software is installed, and this is, the, uh, this is the, again, the, the vulnerable version tie back to CBS for easy mitigation. Um, and then lastly is over on the threat intelligence side of the house. Uh, so uh, we believe we have, I personally believe that we have the, some of the best threat intelligence at, on, in the industry. Um, so what can we do to give you properly uh, curated intelligence that, is, uh, that it, you can take and do things within hunting in your environment? We've got the subscription services. Again, everything is properly managed. And again, it's, it's, it's good uh, data that's been curated by humans as well as some of the, the AI and machine learning. All right. And then uh, just to, to touch upon this, uh, just from a little bit of it more, uh, we do have, from a search perspective, this really awesome malware repository. Uh, goes back at, at least six years. We've got hundreds of millions of, of pieces, and again, all searchable. So in case you want to do some really cool threat hunting, uh, write your own YAR rules, search for binaries and other strings, et cetera. We do that against our entire uh, malware repository. And then um, the one thing that actually is available to come on premises within our platform, that again, ties back to the rest of our intelligence and other things we do, is our sandbox tech. Uh, you can actually consume this via cloud, uh, hosted SaaS or come on, pre on, on, on premises and load up your own images. But if you have targeted environments and you know, you're getting a lot of malware that, say, do, that looks for various indicators that it's within your infrastructure, um, you see this a lot with nation state adversaries, it's, it, the malware is custom targeted towards you. So it won't detonate in, in oftentimes when it's not in your environments. Well, you can load up your custom images, uh, load up uh, the, the binaries and malware, et cetera, and then we'll go through the dynamic and static analysis. So kind of cool. All right, um, lastly, I'm gonna cover uh, our threat graph technology. This is a direct tie back to the big data problem and the, and the massive amounts of data that's being generated. All right, um, 
think about this, 90 billion events per day, and how do you go through it? This is our threat graph here. So what we do is we are able to consume more data um, and faster, and this allows us to, uh, to build our, our next, uh, basically our, our platform and deliver good services to you. So this is all uh, relational based. We have uh, literally hundreds of millions of uh, vertices and edges that we're going through. And again, all our, our two cloud machine learning models and, and more to come beyond that are all running on this processing data set that's coming in with you live. This is, uh, we believe the solution to a significant portion of the future cybersecurity problems, and this is how we're going to help public sector uh, overcome uh, the threats of the future. All right, so with that said, uh, are there any questions? And I just do want to remind you all that, again, because this is a public setting, if there's anything that you don't feel comfortable with talking about uh, in an environment, especially one that's being recorded, uh, we can have a separate breakout session. All right. Thank you very much.